Well, good morning. Marlene, I see her in the back. She's going to come up and read a poem. In Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies grow. Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the lark still bravely singing flies, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch, be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Some of you may not be aware, but we have a couple of uh, people in the congregation that are veterans, Joe Jacuti, Ernie Tallman. We've actually got one of our younger family members, uh, Jordan Kuhar, who's finished his term with the military. He was in the Navy stationed out in Squamish. We've got two current young people, family members of this congregation, Gareth Crandall and Josh Taylor, that are in active service. So as you pray, I would just ask that you keep in mind these young people, keep in mind the older ones. I'm sure everyone here has some family member back, maybe one or two generations. In my own case, it was my father that served for six years during the Second World War. But I'm sure we've got people that can remember grandfathers or different ones, cousins, whatever. that are. So at this time, we just ask you, Father God, we just pray for these people that are still with us, Lord, that you give them comfort. We pray for the ones that are coming off active service, Lord, that uh, some of the troubles they've seen in their service, that you take these troubled times away from them and you give them a transition in back into civilian life that will uh, allow them to carry on and be credit to their families and that, Lord. So we just pray for the ones that are still in there serving, that you'd guide them, you'd keep them out of trouble. And most of all, we just pray for the families that are not only some that are left behind, but the ones that, that are just suffering because they've lost some family members. And you just give them comfort, Lord, knowing that we do live in, the, as the song says, the land of the free, Lord. And it's because of these people that gave sacrifices over the many years. We thank you again, Lord, for the many blessings you give all of us. And we just thank you in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. This is Jim. If you have not met him, you should meet him. He's an interesting gentleman, and he's going to share some stuff with you today. Good morning. As you're aware, uh, 2014 marks several military anniversaries. It's the 100th anniversary of the First World War, the beginning of it the 75th anniversary of the Second World War, and it's the 70th anniversary of the D-Day invasion at Normandy. I had originally thought about a different story, but then on thinking about the 70th anniversary of D-Day, I decided this time I would feature the story of someone rather close to me, and that was my dad. Um, Dad originally enlisted in the Army. He did his basic training at Camp Borden. And he found that all a private could do at Camp Borden, it seemed to him, was dig trenches. And then after you were through digging the trenches, you filled them back in again. Consequently, he transferred to the RCAF. His first school in RCAF was at number three bombing and gunnery school in McDonald, Manitoba. 
When he finished that, and before he got on the train to come back east, he and quite a few other fellows lined up at a small local photography store, had their picture taken, dis prominently displaying their air gunner wings. Don't I look just like them? <laughs> Not. Anyways, from there, Dad traveled to Halifax, and he and 19,999 other soldiers and airmen embarked on the Queen Mary. It wasn't a pleasure cruise. He was issued a blanket and was told to sleep on the deck. They made it safely across, and from there he went through a series of training schools, operational training units, they called them. First on twin-engine bombers, Wellingtons, then on to the first four-engine bombers, Sterling, and finally into Lancaster Finishing School. An interesting thing occurred when Dad was at the finishing school. His crew was put together. Dad was ushered into a room by the gunnery officer, and standing there were two pilot officers that both needed a gunner. The one chap, his name was Freeman. He was your typical gentleman British officer. Pencil mustache, dressed to the nine, buttons polished, shoes polished, everything just in order. The second chap, his name was Stockwell, he was the exact opposite. He looked like he slept in his clothes, never polished his buttons or his boots, and he was a cockney, kind of a chubby-faced little fellow. And Dad, of course, never wanting to choose favorites, said, well, flip a coin. The coin toss ended up with Dad going with Stockwell, the fellow that slept in his clothes. In May 1944, his crew was assigned to 44 Rhodesia Squadron at Dunham Lodge in the south of England. It was here that they did their, their tour. Um, they didn't get very far. They did a few training operations, and Stockwell came down with a sinus infection, which grounded the entire crew for about nine days. I'll refer to Dad's memos here. He says, while we were grounded, we put in a pretty easy time. One night I took a bus into Newark Knotts, and after getting off the bus, one of the first people I saw were Sergeant Freeman and his tail gunner. Freeman was the pilot whose crew I wanted to be in, but the flip penny decided otherwise. They told me that a few nights before they had been on operations, and a cannon shell ripped through the fuselage and killed the mid-upper gunner. That's where I would have been, sitting if the penny had landed the other way. Freeman got another mid-upper gunner and went back on ops. It was not long until the entire crew went missing. And on May 9th, Stockwell had recovered from his sinus condition. We made a total of five training flights that day, ending with a three-hour, 20-minute cross-country. We were now supposed to be ready for tour. Bear with me here. I'm following my notes. Okay. Our first operation was Duisburg in the Ruhr Valley. This was known to bomber crews as Happy Valley. It was the most heavily defended area of Germany. He said, I remember the first sight of the enemy coastline with searchlights waving back and forth. Tracer bullets streaming upward into the darkness like water coming out of a hose. The target, I guess, was typical but ominous looking to beginners. On the return trip, our pilot went up to 24,000 feet in an attempt to get away from it all. I had been chewing gum, and the atmosphere was so dry that the gum went to pieces in my mouth. Toward the end of May, we went on nine days leave, returning June the 4th. 
On the evening of June the 5th, we were briefed to bomb the gun emplacements at Cherbourg. The intelligence officer said he didn't know, but he thought that something big was about to happen. Returning from the target above thick clouds over England and the channel, we met wave after wave of gliders being towed by Dakotas, Sterlings, etc. We were sure that something big was about to happen. When we woke at noon that day, someone turned the radio on and the BBC News announced that the invasion of France had started that morning. The next night, we bombed bridges in Caen, France, from 4,000 feet. And for several nights after that, we bombed other bridges, railroad yards, etc. in France. On the 14th of June, we bombed a panzer division in Oui sur odon We were briefed to bomb it in four waves, each wave having five minutes. B. Baker, our aircraft, was to be in the fourth wave. And as we came up to the target, the smoke from heavy flak explosions was hanging all the way from eight to 18,000 feet and across a front of two miles. Going over the target, we could feel the aircraft uh, shudder several times from nearby explosions. Now, Dad, look to the next picture. I mentioned here Dad was a mid-upper gunner. That's the turret you see up there in the upper right corner. It was bad enough to have to be in the second most hazardous position on a Lancaster, the, the most hazardous being the tail gunner. Enemy aircraft would come in from the rear, and the tail gunner was usually the first one hit. But the mid-upper gunner had the honor of being right directly under that RAF roundel. Talk about having a target painted on your back. Anyways, I'll carry on. On the 21st of June, 44 and 619 squadrons, which were both based at Dunham Lodge, had a total of 32 aircraft bombing a synthetic oil plant in Wesseling in Germany. The losses were heavy, and each squadron had six aircraft that failed to return. There's seven crew members in each aircraft. He said the mess hall was strangely silent at breakfast that morning. There was 84 people that were lost just that one night. On an operation to bomb a railway junction at Givors in France on the 26th of July, 1944, we encountered thunderclouds as we crossed the French coast going in, and we had them to contend with all the way to the target and back. When we arrived at the target, there were no target indicators in position, so we started circling. There was a squadron called Pathfinders, which were the most experienced navigators and pilots available, and they were to drop flares over the target, and the incoming bombers were to bomb on the flare. The problem was some of the bomber force was circling clockwise, and some were circling counterclockwise. Now, bear in mind, this is night bombing. It's pitch black. You can't see a thing. There were several mid-air collisions. Eventually, an Aussie voice came over the radio, put your bloody lights on! So most of the aircraft did put their lights on, which probably lessened the danger of collision. While in the thunderclouds, the sparks were jumping off all the aerial wires back and forth between our guns, and the tips of propellers were illuminated as well with what was known as St. Elmo's fire. <coughs> now, sometimes it was scary on every trip. You never, you could see aircraft going down all around you. But one of the most frightening experiences Dad had Again, I'll let his own words describe it. We set out to do a mining job at Stetton on the 19th of August, 44. But on our way across the North Sea, the starboard outer engine began acting up. It got so bad that Stockwell figured he should feather it or kill it. Since we had to come down to 4,000 feet to drop mines, we would need all the power available to get us out of there. So he thought he'd better turn back. We had five 1,800-pound sea mines on board. And to lessen our landing weight, we dropped two of them safe off the Dutch coast and set out for home with three still on board. When we arrived back at base, most of the landing lights were out. 
but we flew around to the call-up position, and the pilot asked permission to land. No response was forthcoming. So we began to circle the aerodrome. While circling, the port inner engine caught fire, and a huge stream of flames, smoke, and sparks were whipping past my turret. Stockwell at once asked the engineer to engage the fire extinguisher on the port inner. The engineer made a stab in the dark at the button and fortunately hit the right one. The fire went out. The pilot then pressed his radio transmitter button, and if my memory serves me correctly, his report was as follows. Old Duke Baker to Blue Stripe. My starboard outer engine is feathered. My port inner is on fire. I have three mines on board. I'm coming in. The reply came back at once. Blue Stripe to Old Duke Baker. Pancake out. He made a beautiful landing on two engines, but since the port inner activated the hydraulic pump for the flaps, they had no flaps. They overshot the runway at 85 miles an hour right through the perimeter fence into a turnip field. Dad said when the turnip field's mud finally brought the aircraft to a stop, you never saw a crew get out of a plane as fast as they did that day because those three mines were still dangling in the, in the bomb bay. Now, before I go to his last mission, I will mention one thing about Dad. He was a teetotaler through the entire operations. Most of his friends, whenever they got the chance, they'd go pub crawling. But Dad stayed back, read his Bible, read poetry, whatever. His crew trusted him with most of their pay because they knew they'd squander it in the pubs if they didn't leave it with him. Just once, they convinced him to go into town with them. And I'll never forget him saying, he walked into this pub. He said, you couldn't see the back of the room for cigarette smoke. They were dancing in there so tight, all they could do was just kind of wiggle around. There was really no room to dance. And, of course, the smell of booze permeated the place. Now, Dad occasionally read Shakespeare, too. I mean, he was just a dirt farmer, but he loved poetry and literature. He said when he walked in that room, a quote from Shakespeare came to his head. What fools these mortals be. Anyways, he mentions his last two trips. Amazingly enough, they saved the, the best for last. He says, our last two trips were mining operations, like dropping mines. And both were 10-hour trips to Konigsberg and Danzig to seal in shipping destined for the Eastern Front. Our route was across Denmark at Copenhagen, across the tip of Sweden, and then in a southeasterly direction across the Baltic Sea. Returning from the first operation, we were told our home base was fogged in, and to land at Gravely, where a FIDO system was in operation. At these particular bases, they had two rows of pipes down both sides of the runway, and they filled those pipes with gasoline. And on a foggy night, they would ignite these things. And the pilot would be able to see the base from miles away. And I remember Dad saying that landing on a FIDO-equipped station was like dropping into hell. But it got them safely down. He says, I remember some of the thoughts that occurred to me when returning from the last trip as we turned into the funnel position and made our final approach. There was a thankfulness to God for sparing our lives. There was joy at having a tour completed. There was a touch of sadness at the thought that we would probably never again fly together as a crew. And there were the words from the title of the poem by Theodore Tilton. Even this shall pass away. Now Dad volunteered for a second tour, but he was told there was lots of young fellows coming up from the Commonwealth Air Training Program that needed a kick at the can as well. He volunteered to help with the food drops in Holland. 
In the winter of 1944, the Germans basically starved the Dutch people. They were eating tulip bulbs to survive. They reached an agreement with the Germans to drop food in at a low level to keep the Dutch people from starving. Again, Dad was told he wasn't needed. After his tour, Dad was recommended by his squadron leader for the DFM, the Distinguished Flying Medal. This is what the CO submitted. This non-commissioned officer has now carried out 34 successful operational sorties as mid-upper gunner. Among targets which he has attacked on such he are such heavily defended places, heavily defended places as Stuttgart and Wesseling. On the night of the 9th and 10th of June, you can flick that other picture, please. When taking part in an attack on the marshalling yards at Etamp, the aircraft in which he was flying was attacked by a Junkers 88 in conditions which were most favorable to the enemy fighter. Flight Sergeant Boland's accurate directions to his captain enabled him to bring accurate fire to bear upon the enemy, whose attack was thus foiled and caused it to break away under conditions which pointed to its having sustained damage. Again on the night of the 25th, 26th of July, 44, while returning from an attack on Stuttgart, his aircraft was attacked by an enemy night fighter. Flight Sergeant Bowen's promptness in opening fire and his strict compliance with aircrew drills resulted in the enemy being driven off without causing any damage to the aircraft. This extremely efficient and capable air gunner has not only helped to raise the morale of his fellows in the air, but has become a most valuable asset to his squadron in his work on the ground where he's been of the greatest assistance to the gunnery leader. I strongly recommend Flight Sergeant Boland for the non-immediate award of the Distinguished Flying Medal. Dad had to wait until he got home. There was a presentation at the London Armouries. Now that was before the hotel went up in the middle of it. And he was awarded the DFM by uh, the Governor General of Canada uh, in a special presentation. We have Dad's medals on display here. The DFM is the center lower one. When Dad was coming back across on the Andes, not quite as luxurious an uh, uh, boat as the Queen Mary, again, his crew and friends gave him hundreds of dollars. Uh, he had five five of these money belts full of money which he gave back to the fellows when they disembarked at Halifax. We have several other artifacts here of interest. This is a flare gun. Each aircraft had one of these. It was mounted in a flange behind the wireless operator. If you had wounded on board coming back, you would send off a red flare as you were approaching the landing strip and you would get priority to come in or if your aircraft was shot to bits. If you had a navigator who got you lost and you ended up over London or Coventry and your own anti-aircraft battery started blasting away at you, you were assigned a flare, which was the color of the day. If it be green or blue or red or whatever, you would immediately put one of these in the flare gun and shoot it off, and hopefully the batteries on the ground would realize that you were a friendly aircraft and didn't proceed to try to blow you to bits. The same gun, if equipped with the barrel extension like this, was used to let the crews know after they were all lined up, ready to go, they'd all be revving up their engines, 35 or so aircraft all in a row, but they didn't hit the throttle until the flare was green. Green meant your operation was on. Red meant you could taxi back to your dispersal. 
they didn't often get a red one, unfortunately. Now, Dad worked for 42 years at a job that he hated. Just before his retirement, I got a phone call from his employer asking me if I had a photograph of Dad's Lancaster. I said, it was illegal to take a photograph of an aircraft on the base. You could get charged for spying. But yes, we have one. <laughs> that's, the pic that's the picture there below Dad's box. I didn't know what they wanted it for, but I managed to spirit it out of the house without Dad missing it. Dad was a very quiet man. He didn't like parties and certainly didn't like to be the center of attention. He knew that after 42 years, they'd want to throw a retirement party for him. Where Dad worked, he was able to accumulate sick leave. He had six weeks worth of it that he'd never used. So he decided he'd take his vacation, roll in his sick leave, and then just phone in that he was retired, avoiding any fuss. <laughs> It didn't work that way. I got a call from his boss again saying, make sure your dad is home on this particular Sunday. I said, fine. We were sitting in the backyard at the farm, and he hears car horns honking. And we look down the road, here's this huge convoy of cars coming down the road, balloons and everything flying. He said, oh, it must be a wedding. And they pulled in his driveway. There was about 75 people had an impromptu retirement party in Dad's backyard. He was highly thought of. They gave him a color console TV. This was in 1984. We'd never had a color TV before. I didn't even know what Donald Duck looked like in color. <laughs> anyway, he was admiring the TV, and they handed him a package wrapped in paper. He opened it up. And it was that painting of his Lancaster. The call letters are correct. The serial number on the fuselage is correct. The yellow things you see below the cockpit are bombs. Each time they completed a successful mission, another bomb was painted on the aircraft. That was one of his cherished possessions. And as a note, many Lancasters never made it past their first or second trip. That one was shot down three weeks before the end of the war on its 99th trip. Stockwell, Dad's pilot, went on to do three tours, over 90 missions, and survived the war and became a commercial pilot. They promised after the war that they would keep in touch, but of course as time went on they lost contact. One morning in the late 1980s, Dad was awakened by the phone ringing at about 6.30 a.m. He reached over and grabbed the bedside phone. And there was a chap talking away to him a mile a minute with a thick English accent. And Dad kind of just talked on, and finally the fellow says, You don't know who this is, do you? Dad said, No, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. Stockwell here. Well, after that, they exchanged Christmas cards and notes and postcards until Stockwell passed away. And we lost Dad in 2006. He wanted a simple funeral. He figured there was no need for a Friday or a pre-funeral visitation. He said, "Just open the doors an hour before the funeral. That's all we need." He didn't know how much he was loved. Neither did we. There was a line up down the street. Dad never wanted to obviously glorify war, but he did join the Bomber Command Association, the Air Gunners Association. He and Mother used to go to their monthly meetings out at 427 Wing here at Crumlin. 
when they heard he had passed away, the Air Gunners Association and the Bomber Command Association asked if they could participate in the funeral. We agreed. I'd never seen a legion or command funeral. Here's all these old gentlemen dressed in their legion uniforms, or a few of them actually fit into their Air Force uniforms, many of them with their walkers. But they draped this RCAF flag over Dad's coffin. They lined up one by one, marched as best they could up to the coffin, pinned their poppy on the flag, did a smart right wheel, which for some of these old gentlemen who had left their walkers at the back of the room was no small feat, God bless them, and marched back. Now, toward the end, Dad didn't want to talk about what he'd been through. And if anyone asked him to tell a little bit about his war experiences, although he had written it all down, he would simply say, he would quote Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you for sharing your father's uh, testimony. guys doing this morning? I promise I'll be quick. All right. Hey, how you guys doing? Who has socks on today? Who is forced to put socks on today? Yeah? I want you to turn to your mom, wherever they are, your, your dad, and say, thank you for making me put my socks on today. Who buys your socks? Yeah. Do, do you sometimes get a choice on what socks you get to wear? Yeah. yeah? Do they encourage you with socks not to wear to church? Like the ones with the big pom-poms. Yeah, the ones that come up to here. I was going to wear the ones that went up to here, and I couldn't find them. Yeah? But they make sure that you have your socks on. As you grow up, they make sure you have your left foot on, your right foot, and what, what well, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, they make sure you have your shoes on the right feet. They make sure you're wearing warm enough clothes as it's getting colder out there. They want to make sure we have warm enough clothes. They will provide you with warmer socks and keep you warmer through the winter. And also, if you, in, the, in, the, in this month, it's gonna, there's a lot of rain and we like splashing around in the puddles. And after you splash around in the puddles, they like to change your socks out. Well, it's no different in the Army. In the Army, they, one of the things they, I was just talk, talking with Josh today, they make sure that you change your socks. That's very important. There's a lot of movies, too. I was trying to find some movie quotes, but I couldn't find just the quote. Um, they make sure you change your socks because you're marching along, and the most and one of the more important things, if you were a, a troop soldier, was to change your socks. Because as your socks got wet, your feet got wet and soggy and, and thin, and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? What's that? they would get very cold. And they used to get all sorts of sores on their feet. Well, they're walking on their feet all the time. Their feet were the most important part of their body. They had to take care of their feet. So the sergeant was always on them saying, change your socks. How's your socks? Kept on asking them, how are your socks okay? Are they wet? How's your feet, soldier? And they would always make sure that you changed your socks. That was very important. And that they, should, they were very thankful for that after the war that their sergeant, their, their commander, was always telling them to change their socks. When I used to go camping, the most important thing was to change your socks before we went to bed. Because over the, over the night, our socks would freeze. Even though it didn't feel wet, we still had sweat in our socks, and it would get very cold. But it was extremely cold to take your socks off in the middle of winter and put new socks on. So we didn't like doing it, but when we did it, it was 
wonderful experience in the morning when we woke up with nice warm piggies on our feet. But the homeless don't always get the opportunity for somebody to not only say, hey, change your socks, but here are some new socks. So again, we remind you that we have that table out there and we're going to provide socks for the homeless. And then the Arc Aid Mission, um, what's the other one? Uh, the Center of Hope, um, the missions in London are going to say, hey, how's your socks? You are loved. They're not going to say which church does love them, but we know that it's, you are loved by Dorchester Community Church. Here's some <laughs> socks. Change out your socks. And here's a homeless foot, worn and battered. But that little bit of protection is keeping them a little bit warm. But how great would it be if your parents came up to you and you had socks like that and they said, hey, <laughs> those are disgusting. Change them. Now, go up to your room, change them. We take it for granted and these guys need it. So again, now with feeling, look at your mom or your parents and say, thank you for our socks. <laughs> First Thessalonians say, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I just want to go on to say, it says, we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and everyone else. And when it says and everyone else, it means everyone else. Your enemies, your friends, your strangers, anybody that needs help, we're going to try to help them. Um, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And when we go to Sunday school class today, we're going to learn about gratitude and the gratitude of those in the Bible and how grateful people are to receive blessings from others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for everything that we have. Thank you for those that provide for us, that provide us knowledge at school, clothing at home, we also thank you for providing things to people that we don't know. We thank you for all those that provide for socks and food and, and time and service to those that are in need of it. We're not always in need, and we're grateful for everything that we have. But we thank you and ask that you care for those that don't have anything. As we go to Sunday school and learn about gratitude and learn how we could be thankful for you, Jesus, in your name, amen. As the kids go, I know Colleen's got to teach today. Uh, Colleen, why are we collecting toilet paper for the month of November? What's the impetus so of that? So we're collecting toilet paper for the month of November because in the same way that our friends who live on the streets in London and who are not properly housed may have no socks, that we also know that it there are many times that they don't have toilet paper and that is another thing that we take totally for granted. We have multiple rolls in our own closet. So if you are able and willing to bring us a roll of toilet paper, a package of toilet paper, we will give it to the ARC. We've checked in with Doug and we know that that's a necessity that they will absolutely use um, for the families and the individuals they serve. And in terms of our sock drive, we are at 751 pairs of socks. And we're, Mark has encouraged me to up the amount, so I've gone to 1,751. I've upped it by one. So there we go.
this begin with me let this be the moment now song.